Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. Today's journey is into yesterday's election, which was or is the most important election in most of our lives, or at least not mine, but this generation. <laughs> and so we want to talk to Laura Nevis, who is the executive director of the Democratic Party, about this election and what it portends for the future. So welcome, Laura. Thank you very much. Laura is the executive director of the local Democratic Party, but you have worked at other parties all over the country, which is why I wanted to talk. Well, I haven't worked for, but I've worked with. I have worked in um, five other states across the country over the last 20 plus years. Um, primarily, um, spent a lot of time in Wisconsin and Minnesota, are kind of my home bases and where I started working, but have been. Are you originally from Minnesota? I am not. I'm a base brat. My dad was in the Air Force, oh. and so um, I, I always kind of my short spiel. I was born in California, spent my childhood in um, Texas, grew up on the East Coast, um, graduated high school there, then went back to the Southwest, um, ended up in the Midwest after falling in love, and um, oh. have spent many, many years there, but have worked in the Deep South in, in Louisiana and in Michigan, um, the Pacific Northwest and Washington State, and now Hawaii. So I've been kind of a lot of places. Well, let's talk for, for Hawaii. Mm -hmm. The woman that was elected governor of Guam. Oh, yes. Very exciting. Um, and the first time, I believe, in a while, they've had a Democratic governor. Um, and I was just reading a report. Um, part of my job is I actually get to be in touch with all the executive directors of all the state parties um, all the time. And so it was, you know, yesterday getting emails from the Guam ED that they were very excited that this was happening for them. So, yes. Now, Guam is a territory. It's a territory of the United States. So, yep. so they have a representative in Congress but they don't vote. Is that correct? Is that the I believe so. I believe that it's very much like Puerto Rico, right? Like there. Puerto Rico. Yep. Um, let's see if I have a name for their person. Okay. I'm Mike Nickel Mike San Nichols. Yep. Is US Congress. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so that person gets to go to DC but they don't have a vote. But they don't have so yeah, a vote. we have 50 states and seven territories, um, and they, it's kind of an odd that they elect somebody to Congress, but they don't actually get to vote on it. <laughs> so it's a strange. I said we, we more often hear this in reference to Puerto Rico than we do. And the District of Columbia. In the District of Columbia, um, but we, we forget that we have, you know, the Mariana Islands and Guam and well, American about, Samoans and. Um, yeah, what about the rest of the Mariana Islands? Uh, Saipan, Rota, Tinian. Yeah, so they're they're collectively we call them the Marianas, and then they have same thing that they've kind of they have represented. I believe so. I mean, I'm not. I don't. I don't quote no. me on it. <laughs> not up on my but, territories as much as I but am. But we do have a representative from Samoa, mm -hmm. American Samoa, American Samoa, and Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and D.C. Mm -hmm. and Guam. Yeah. What there are, are a few others. I just like I said we have seven territories. I can't name them off the top of my head. But okay. Anyway. All right. Okay. So that's. I'm excited about. Yeah. You know about we, that one. We elected uh, over 100 women to Congress just last night. I mean, it is historical the number 100 of women. 100 women. Over 100 women. I um, uh, got elected to. You know, it's historical the number of women who got elected last night. Unprecedented numbers for the for and women of color, which is um, pretty you know, amazing to watch. We, we elected our first Native American out of New Mexico. We elected our first Muslim woman out of Michigan. We elected our first Somali Muslim um, refugee out of Minnesota. Um, and the list goes on. I mean, it really is, you know, the thing, if you want to look for the good things that the, happened The young lady in New York. The long, Reagan. Yep, first Latina, youngest woman elected yeah. to Congress. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, these are the things when you're looking for hope and you're looking for positive change. 
Um, what happened yesterday really was historical. While there were some very disappointing losses in places we really thought maybe we could do it, um, and those were heartbreaking for many reasons, there were also just um, many amazing clouds of, like, silver linings that happened. Um, we took back a lot of governorships in states that were once red. Um, we took back the House, which was really the main goal, and so Democrats should be really proud of that work. We set a goal and we achieved it, and we're looking at over probably 35 seats when we're all said and done, um, which is huge. Um, and we've kind of, you know, we've now have some check and unbalance on what is going on in Washington, D.C. that we didn't have before. Do you think, given the way Mr. Trump uh, acts, he thinks he's a dictator, mm -hmm. but the number one, number one yeah. in the Constitution is the House of Representatives. Right. And it tells the function of the House of Representatives mm -hmm. and who they are. Right. And the only thing it tells about presidents is how to get rid of them. Right. Yes. So it is the power of the House of Representatives to start impeachment processes if they wanted right. to do it. That starts in the House, not your Senate. Um, of course, you know, given the news of this morning with the firing of Just Sessions and um, the shakeup in the DOJ, it's going to be interesting now to see what happens in the next 48 hours. Um, when I left this morning to come to work, Rod Rosenstein was on his way over to the White House, so we have yet to see kind of how if he this got rid of, got rid of him too. Um, but it will then become the you know it will become when we get a new Congress in January. It is a, incumbent upon them to kind of take up that charge. If, if we think what's going to happen is going to happen, and this really is an attempt to get rid of Mueller, um, it will be their responsibility to kind of take that charge back up. Now they go to D.C. next week. They will they go to. Yep. When are they sworn in? Not till Jan January 20-ish. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember the dates always. Yep. Yeah. Well, Colleen Anabusa said yeah. just last week about what she was looking, because she's still in Congress. Yep. So she had to go back and she said, if mm -hmm. this were to happen, right. the, con the, the confusion and all of the things mm -hmm. that have to happen right. to make that transfer. Yep. Transition. So that was why she had to go home, yep. go back. Yep. They're all. They'll go back and they'll figure out um, who they'll elect their new speaker. Um, they'll make sure all their chairmanships are in place. They'll make sure they're all going in strong on when they're elected on the same page, because um, they know they have a fight ahead of them. It doesn't end because they won the house yesterday. There is still now lots and lots, and lots of work to do. Um, and I think they're trying to be very strategic and understanding that they have to walk a very tight rope um, in, um, you know, they now are the president's foil, which he loves. Um, he loves another, nothing better than having a fight. And so they really have to be clear and strong, at the same time calm and resolute about what they're going to do and making sure they all stick together. Um, it's the only way we're going to be able to move forward. You let's go to the governors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my favorite one. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to talk about all the others. Just one. Just one. Just one. Yeah, Wisconsin. Yes. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We can all thank the Lord, right? Um, you know, and for me, <laughs> he's he's a union buster. He's a union buster, and you know, I started my political life in Wisconsin, so I have a place in my heart there. And to have watched when I was there. Um, uh, you know, it was Tommy Thompson, and then um, Governor Doyle, Democrats took it back. Uh, but then um, after he left, it has been Scott Walker, and to have watched that state go completely into ruin. Um, and interesting enough, I had since moved to Minnesota, so you, ha you know, always lived in this comparison of Mark Dayton and Scott Walker got elected at the same time, and to watch two completely divergent paths happen um, under a Democratic leadership and under a Republican leadership, and watch one state thrive and survive an economic crisis um, in Minnesota, Minnesota um, and a governor who ran on taxing the rich and implemented that, and it actually created great economic opportunity and, and sustainability for Minnesota, to then watching a governor in Wisconsin who went completely the opposite way, and to have that state now in financial ruin, um, union busting, um, costing workers and people jobs, lives, health care, all that kind of stuff. So it is quite to watch yesterday, to watch a superintendent, a teacher, 
<laughs> Actually, now interesting, both Wisconsin and Minnesota have teachers as their governors. Oh, she, yeah. So um, I think that. Do we have who that is? So, uh, Tim Walz, who was a Tim former Walsh. congressman yeah. in, um, and was a former um, teacher out of Mankato, became the governor, and your first Native American lieutenant governor in the state of Minnesota. But Wisconsin, so it was, it was fantastic to watch that happen in Wisconsin to finally um, see that shift the tide finally. Well, what about their legislature? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. I don't know the final turnout of it. They had been a solid red. Um, yeah, they had supported and I don't, him. I don't, not sure if the, how the House seats and state Senate turned out in Wisconsin. I know in Minnesota they took back the House. Um, I don't, but I think <coughs> did not take back the Senate, but that's, you know. Two out of three. Two out of three, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but um, Indiana seemed to be more red than ever. Yep. Yeah, That's and I think, you know, it's home. Yep. And I think, you know, we cannot, we constantly kind of underestimate the, and I, I don't want to really call them Trump voters because I don't really know. I think he just brings out whatever this is. But, you know, he, he went and campaigned in Indiana um, and, you know, we cannot under, underestimate that effect because the, it does, he has an impact and we can't ignore it um, as much as we would love to because <laughs> what he is saying is completely offensive. Um, but I think as a party, we've made some dents in those red states and we need to look at what that is and how we expand that. Um, we have to understand that there's always just going to be a certain majority of people we are never going to convince to support us. Um, but how do we expand our electorate, and how do we bring more people in? So, well, I think when you look, Mitt Romney mm -hmm. is now what, what a senator, senator out of Utah, yeah. But he's he's such an I hate to say nice Republican. <laughs> well, they call, Can, he's yeah. what they call a moderate Republican, yeah. right? We don't have a lot left anymore. Yes, that's what I was going <laughs> to say. That I remember when they were yeah. all like that. Exactly, yeah. like that used to be the uh, yeah. It's kind of a shame. I mean, I grew up. My dad was a lifelong Republican. But he was what we turn, tend to refer to as kind of that old school social justice Republican. Right. Um, and they don't exist at all anymore, no. right? So that's kind of, um, I was very proud that um, before he passed away, he voted for Barack Obama as, because um, he was that social justice and really mm -hmm. felt like as a country that we, um, it was inconceivable to him that we would not elect someone just because of, because of the color of their skin. Which I laughed because I wanted to be like, I don't know where you live, but <laughs> clearly that happens a lot. But it spoke to that need, you know, for him it was yeah. it was time. And I think he would not recognize the Republican Party today if he were still alive. No. And in 1964, which of course I remember, mm. uh, it was the Republicans that really mm -hmm. supported the Civil right. Rights Act. Absolutely, right. And the Democrats. Because mm -hmm. LBJ said we've lost the Democrats for generations. Right. You had the Dixiecrats back the then, Dixie right? Crats. So it was a totally they, different. They left. Yeah. But it's interesting. Those were all your Southern Democrats who are now your Southern Republicans. Right. So the same people just shifted parties. So it's mm -hmm. kind of an interesting. And now we're saying that, although you know, it's you can see the movement in the South finally happening. And while we didn't win-win um, outright, um, you definitely see the shift happening. Um, you've got. Contested governor's race in Georgia still happening, and they're going to take that to a recount. You've got now the Senate, uh, the governor and Senate seat in Florida, um, tight as can be, and it was also going to go to a recount. We probably won't know for weeks, but you definitely see that demographic and the shift. And even if you look into Kentucky and Tennessee, while those Senate seats lost, the the gain in the percentage point and the number of voters that are Democrats has substantially increased. So I think. And as much as I hate to say this, I think that we have to thank Trump. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because from the day he was elected, mm -hmm. I have not seen this kind of mo mobilizing yeah. oh, energy, sure. Correct. whatnot, since the 60s. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, sometimes as human beings, we have our bad that it takes till we're on the precipice of losing everything we have before we finally do we something. And I think that's what he has motivated, that yeah. we're really understanding that our rights as people are at risk. Well, uh, we need to take a break. Okay. And we will be back in 60 seconds. Awesome. We'll see you. Aloha. I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green for Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 
and I have really, really exciting guests on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Marcia, and today we are talking to my dear friend, and you all know I only talk to dear friends, <laughs> Laura Nevis, who is the exact Nevit, 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 Nevit. <laughs> only one Nevit. That's right. <laughs> okay. She is the executive director of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. And Laura, we are talking about yesterday's historic election. I know. It didn't is. all turn out, but most of it. Yeah. Listen, um, let's talk about other uh, Democratic victories. Um, Kansas governor. Yeah, seriously, I mean, I, I mean, you want to look at, I mean, Kansas, <laughs> Kansas, the, one of the reddest, reddest states, just elected a Democratic governor. Uh, shocking, right? But yay, <laughs> in a good way. A woman. And woman. Laura Kelly. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, unseated Chris Kobach, who was right. the, you know, the architect of uh, many, many, many voter suppression laws um, and had headed up Trump's, right, his voter suppression task force. Oh, wow. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, that that one is truly a thank the Lord, you know, there <laughs> there is hope in, in deep red places. Um. Oh, Jackie Rosen. Jackie Rosen out of Nevada. Um, yes. Yeah, fantastic. That was a late one. We didn't know. Um, I didn't see it till this morning. But, but she's openly gay. She's openly gay, and yeah, no, she is right. So I'm like, as I said, we have. There are just so many things about yesterday that you can look at that are just amazing, amazing. Um, that I think outweigh the kind of like I said the disappointments that yeah. we had. And uh, well, some, one of the craziest things I read. Mm -hmm. was about the man in Nevada oh. <laughs> that got elected, and he's been dead since October. Yep. Yeah, isn't that funny? Only in Nevada would a, <laughs> would a brothel owner, first yeah, of all, be able to run for the state house, um, die, and still get elected. So yes. it was kind and of funny. Trump and Trump campaigned for him knowing <laughs> he was dead. Right. So it's kind of... It's Nevada. What do you want to do? This is why we love Nevada, right? Our ninth island. The ninth <laughs> island. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Yeah. I, I just love that story. It is just, it's just just precious, isn't it? Right. But it's also what makes you know doing politics and elections fun. It's all this stuff happens. It's you know up and down and all over the place. And and ultimately everybody puts in their work, campaigns work hard, and their staff work hard, and go out and knock on doors and phone call and text, which you all get and get annoyed by, um, but it's countless, countless hours of that put in. Um, but at the end of the day, it's kind of a crapshoot because it's up to the voters to go to the polls and cast their ballot. And we don't know ultimately how it's going to turn out um, until the results come in. And so you get some of these fun surprises that are like, really? Well, You're when, gonna, we <laughs> have up? the woman in New Mexico, native, first Native, first native American woman to go to Congress. I mean, that, I mean, again. But I have a question about that. Yeah. Because Kamala Harris is also Native American. She's in the Senate. Oh, okay. <laughs> Different right. But, right, so this is kind of a, but again, another historical. We had many, many firsts last night. I actually got to meet um, Deborah in, when I was in Chicago this summer for a DNC meeting. Phenomenal woman. It's, she's going to be, um, that's just about time we have Connecticut, a voice. first black woman. Mm -hmm. First black woman to Congress. Oh, wow. Yep. And I think we got our first, who's the first openly gay governor? Oh, shoot, now I've lost, I can't remember what state now. Anyway. I know, I saw him. I know, I'm totally, I'm like, too many, yeah, too I, many going on yes, that I can't remember, many, yeah. so. Two Muslim American women. Yep, so one, one is uh, out of Michigan, she's, Muslim, she's from Pakistan, 
and um, the other is a woman out of Minnesota, and she's a Somali refugee. So not only is, is Ilhan Omar our uh, you know second, well we kind of have two. I don't know which one's technically first. I actually think. The woman um, Omar came when she was 12 years old. Well, no, but I mean, they keep going the first Muslim. Yeah. Only one of them can be first. I think the, I think the woman from it says first two, right? <laughs> so, uh, but Ilhan will be our first refugee, um, Somali refugee in Congress, which I think is you know given caravan all this kind. I think is a voice much much needed to be in Congress. Um, and I and and I, I'll just give a shout out Ilhan. I know personally have known her for years. Just going to be amazing. Let's just say that. She's yep. going to be awesome um, and is, you know. Well, now, yesterday in the middle of the election, I saw where um, Ms. Abrams running for governor mm -hmm. in Georgia. Correct. They filed an emergency lawsuit. What does that mean? So it was an emergency stay because polls close at a certain time and they had such problems, especially in a couple of precincts of um, voting machines not working, um, all sorts of continued voter suppression tactics, um, and such long, long lines of people waiting that they had to actually go get an emergency order to keep the polls open so that people could continue to vote. Um, and so they were casting ballots in Georgia well past 10 p.m. last night, which is part of why we don't also have full results. Um, and I, another place where I got up this morning, um, and they are challenging um, I think um, you might actually see a lawsuit happen in Georgia about um, against Kemp and and then voter suppression tactics. But we'll get all the votes counted first and see actually how it turns out, and then go from there. But yeah, well, they did have voter suppression to oh. begin with. Oh, we, yeah. we knew that going yeah. in. Yeah. Well, they tried everything in the book, right? And right. then when it, that failed, it was just shut. You know, oops, machines don't work, right? Yep. So. Yeah. Let's talk about Hawaii. Hawaii. We always talk about low voter turnout when really there's nothing to vote for. Yeah. Well, it's hard in your general here, right? Your, yeah. Most of your your high turnout turns out in your primary. Yes, um, that's the big day. That's the big day here, and that turnout tends to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, but, but then we already know. Then you already know going into your general, although 51% in Hawaii in a general is up from what it normally is, so go Hawaii. But it, you know, it depends on what we are mm -hmm. l looking, what we are comparing. Right. Are we comparing 51 percent of registered voters or 51 percent of the people eligible to vote? Well, it's 51 percent of your eligible voters voted then yesterday. I don't, I don't think right. that's right. I think it should be 51 percent of people that bothered to register. Well, that's what it is. It's if you registered to vote. If you registered, right. but not those that are eligible that didn't register. Well, they don't. You wouldn't count them anyway. You don't count, right? So you only look at your people who are registered to vote and who actually then turned out voting. But it's still up an increase for Hawaii, yeah. which is fantastic, um, and you know still got work to do. Oh yes. Um, so a long way to go, but um, an increase will take an increase, and that clearly shows people more engaged this cycle. Um, and, and participating, and I think, you know, I'm a big fan of lots of campaign, campaign activity just because it does that. It engages people in different places, um, and it helps to, to energize the electorate. Well, I, now we, uh, I know we are the Democrats, but I was pleased to see two Republicans win. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Just I'm, because. Uh, you know, obviously, I, um, I I think no, it, I don't expect you yeah, to. but but I you know I just, think just there, because just because <laughs> there is you know a place for having healthy um, discourse and competition, and I think a little bit of voter apathy is that when you don't when there isn't anything to drive that right. it it that's kind of what hurts us. So yeah, because that's where we get oh, there's nothing to vote for. Right, except this time. Uh, there was the con con and the con am that disappeared Here. with the court. <laughs> right. And most people didn't want heart to be increased. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so people actually read the questions. They did. And I actually got a lot of calls. We got a lot of calls of the office, people wanting, because they wanting information, which was helpful. Um, and so I think we do see where people get energized is around issues. It's right. not really around candidates. And I think that's also why you saw Democrats winning across the board is they were actually out talking about issues, not they weren't they weren't campaigning against Trump. 
they were talking about health care, they were talking about immigration, they were talking about jobs, right? Yeah. And when they did that, they won. Um, and we saw that here in Hawaii. I think what increased is being able to talk about issues that are important to Hawaii. The CONCON was a very interesting debate to have. Um, you know, someone who's not, na obviously not native to Hawaii. Um, I found it fascinating, this idea that you have enshrined in your constitution putting this to a vote every 10 years, right? And so that, I think, is, it creates a space every 10 years to have a conversation about what's important to Hawaii. And do we want to change what our existing rules are, or do we think they're okay for now? Um, and I think that's an okay question to ask. It is. Right? Um, as a party, we decided, right, that, that we wanted folks to vote no on that. But having that conversation is good. And even the Con Am discussion, while I ultimately not, the courts decided it was an invalid question, always important questions to have, conversations to have about how are we funding education? How are we paying our teachers? How are we making sure that our students, every student in the state of Hawaii, has an education that is worthy. Right? Well, I have a question about yeah. that. Two billion dollars in the budget for the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. And yet, we have 573 classrooms mm -hmm. in deferred maintenance. That includes the university. Mm -hmm. Deferred maintenance. Mm -hmm. and we have teachers that say they're not getting paid right. Mm -hmm. And all these other things. Where does $2 billion go? Right, exactly. I think that is the question for your state legislature. Right? Uh, that is my question. Right? I don't, Where I don't, does this is the money $2 go. billion dollars go? go. If uh, we have deferred maintenance, teachers complaining, we lost mm -hmm. 400 teachers last year. They have, right? There are legitimate, legitimate. Questions, legitimate questions and discussions to be having about the funding of our education system in Hawaii um, and, and, and how we do that and what it looks like. You know, it's interesting, Hawaii is one of the few states that there's no automatic funding mechanism for education. A lot of states have it, some do, some don't. Um, but certainly one of the things we know that a properly funded education system is a healthier education system. Yeah. Um, we know that paying our teachers an adequate wage makes for better teachers. And so, um, and better teachers means a better education for your kids. These are people that spend eight hours plus of their day with your children. Yes. You would think should, you would want them the, paid the, the, They should be number one on the pay scale. <laughs> right, so yes. so like, you would think, but it's interesting that that is often not the case. So. Okay. Yeah. One more thing that I thought came to the fore as never before, mm -hmm. and that was OHA. People really got involved they in did. that one. Yeah, and you know, it's a challenge for the Democratic Party uh, because it's a nonpartisan race, um, and so we don't take, you know, we don't get involved. And most of them are Democrats. And most of them are Democrats, and so we would never take sides against one member against another. But I do have to, I have to say, it was actually lovely to hear the amount of conversation going on around that those statewide that you know they're statewide seats so they should be um and as a party we will be looking in the future into like how do we you know what is our work around nonpartisan um member members who run in nonpartisan races so because, because I think the whole city council runs right. so, in. But, but the OHA yeah. one in particular, again, that's a vital piece of Hawaii. Um, and we, uh, you know, there should be more conversation about it. I would hope more people would learn more about their OHA candidates and vote on those. I think a lot of people feel like I'm not native Hawaiian, I does not my, right, right, but they, right, we're all, we're all, you know, residents of Hawaii and the work they do impacts all of us, whether or not you're native Hawaiian or not. Um, and we should be supporting that work. So. Yeah, and they get what about fourteen million a year, and yeah, a lot and of your the, <laughs> And the DOE gets two billion. Right. Hello. Yeah. It's something. Something. Cool. Something's Better. not. Yeah. But I was impressed with yeah. the numbers of young people yeah. that got elected in Hawaii. Yeah. It so it's a whole new. Right, and that happens. We're seeing a generational shift just across the board and everything. And that happens, and it's a good thing. We need to not be afraid of young people coming in and getting involved because we're not, you know, you, me, we're not going to be around forever. No. So, I, you know, other people need to kind of come do this work. Well, one last thing. I saw in um, the young lady, the Republican, mm -hmm. uh, Andrea Topola, mm -hmm. the energy of her supporters, they're all young mm -hmm. and they're all excited. And even last evening when 
they knew she wasn't going to win. Right. The excitement in right. that room, the right. energy, that's the new movement. That and is. not just her, but we saw that in Oha. We saw that across the places. board. Right. And I think Democratic Party, is part. that's part of our work, right? How do we tap into that? What are the issues that we need to be talking about that we're not? How do we engage them into leadership positions? Um, how do we how do we get them? You know, we had a, a lot of young folks who ran for office in the primary. They unfortunately didn't make it past the primary. But we need to build on that, right? Their voices are important, and they need to be at the table. Well, thank you so much, You're quick. Laura. This is anytime. always a pleasure talking <laughs> I know. to you. I know. We have fun. Anytime. Yes, anytime. Yeah. Yeah. I have not missed an election since 1958. Nice. So I am a political junkie, there and I love it. I yeah. love it. <laughs> and I want your hook, you guys. Yes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Aloha.